Hi, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about this book, The Dawn of Everything, I read recently, um, and just give a couple thoughts or ideas. I'll try not to be too long. I'll try to be concise. So the book's by David Graeber and David Wingro. Uh, it's getting a lot of attention uh, as it was just released. So what do I think? Well, first of all, just a minor pet peeve. The book's called The Dawn of Everything. No, no book is everything. So it's, I would, you know, what do you call it? Maybe the dawn of an awful lot. I don't know. But uh, let's, we'll get into a little bit of of some of that, of what, what they left out, maybe a little purposely, or if you read it carefully, you'll notice that they sort of uh, dance around a couple little things, but uh, they're not major because I think it's worth reading. I think the book adds a lot and challenges some of our common assumptions, especially when we think about the ancient past or uh, how societies or systems are made uh, and uh, shape, and some of those just common assumptions. So uh, one of the things the book reminds me a little bit of is uh, Howard Zinn's A People's History in the United States. Now, when I read that book, uh, I was left a little depressed because I was just like, Ugh. I knew a lot of those things, but I was also like, government's evil like the government is up to no good it just does bad things like based on Howard Zinn's narrative and he's not wrong but uh you know one of the things the book Zinn writes at the end is that he wrote this book in response to the stacks and stacks of books that uh you know love the founding fathers or the the U.S. government and you know try to convince us to be patriotic and love our country and to sort of challenge that and say you know don't just take everything the government says at face value because they're up to no good. Um, so, you know, I was left with the, those thoughts for a while. And, um, you know, as I read more and more about history, one of the things I sort of came to understand is that, you know, the way a state works is that it has two primary functions to make it work, to make it work, not to be a good government, but to be a working government. And one is to have a monopoly of violence or a monopoly of force, which means they have, you know, the police force or military that can control a social order, at least in our modern sense. And the dawn of everything, we'll talk a little bit more about that, that concept of monopoly of violence. But, uh, you know, this, this order that controls violence, and so they can create stability, not necessarily to go attack people, but to stabilize and control and keep the peace and order uh, within their own society and their own, their own turf. The other uh, important thing that a state needs to do is be able to collect taxes, i.e. Uh, collect resources and then redistribute them uh, based on whatever they need. So, you know, we need to build a road, we'll collect resources. Uh, how do they effectively get their population to contribute some way, whether that's labor or resources, you know, tax a marketplace, control the marketplace so it's safe, so people will come and uh, play by the rules. And if anybody's cheating anybody, it's the central government that controls the monopoly of violence, right? So uh, that's how a state works. And it, things that a state doesn't need to work is, I don't know, human rights, social justice. Now, maybe those are enlightened uh, ag agendas where, hey, your, our government will actually be more effective if we have human rights or we have... Uh, social justice. We, we actually end up being better, but, uh, you know, not necessarily. There's plenty of examples of states that function without human rights or social justice, uh, you know, which I think if you, you like Howard Zinn's book, you probably think that those things are important. I think they're important, but it doesn't mean a state needs them. So do you, you know, I don't know, do you need to love your country? Well, maybe you respect it, but, you know, love something that's you know, concerned about a monopoly of violence and, you know, taxing you with, you know, they, I don't know if I, you need to love it, but uh, you should, you know, respect it and, you know, understand it, understand it for what it is. So anyway, uh, that is the priorities of the state. So let's get back to the dawn of everything and get more into, uh, especially the idea of state and hierarchies and how systems are made. So uh, one of the key things that I think any book that takes this big approach, you know, the dawn of everything sort of attacks some of the other uh, major thinkers like Noah Harari or Jared Diamond or Steven Pinker, 
uh, is, you know, this, these, there's sort of in the West, there's these sort of two basic figures, you know, the devil and angel sitting on your, your shoulders. And the one is Thomas Hobbes, the other one's Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And, uh, you know, Hobbes is, uh, sitting on your shoulder, whispering into your ear, telling you that, uh, you know, humans are brutal, nasty, tyrants you know and if there wasn't a social order to control them and keep them in line they would all destroy each other and you know everything you know things would implode Rousseau on the other side of you is whispering to you that humans are loving and creative uh people and that it's it's actually the state that uh oppresses them and and hinders them from from um you know being who they they really want to be and you know, as opposite as they are, that you know, we can see some truth in both of those things. Um, you know, Dawn of Everything pretty quickly discounts uh, the Hobbes perspective because it sucks thinking about the way Hobbes thinks about it. It's crappy. You know, no one wants. You know, people are nasty and, and crappy people, and so let's sort of quickly discount those things and focus on the Rousseau thing, and then they sort of fine tune. They say you know, Rousseau's initial thought experiment of what he was thinking about how, uh, you know, how, how the world came to, to how it is with, with kingdoms and, uh, you know, hierarchies, uh, you know, it's not quite accurate when we look now at, at archaeology and we need to refine tune those things, especially if you're on the political left. So you can, you know, if you, you, you can tell a history that, that will correspond and correlate to, what uh you know modern uh political agendas of the the political left and so there's there you have it uh but i think sometimes you know you know again it's not it's a dawn of an awful lot but not the dawn of everything because you know just the fact that you leave the hob stuff out now there's plenty of other books i've read you know uh, a book about you know they go back to chimps uh with sexual violence and then we think of human society and sexual violence and that's a very Hobbesian take you know of, of thinking about those things and that's relevant and real if you want to uh, think about uh, real strategies of how you reduce sexual violence in a, in a society uh, but uh, you know that's looking at the nasty part of human society now there's so much of that I've read so many books where they quote Hobbes very few that quote Rousseau so uh, I don't mind that uh you know, Dawn of Everything talks a lot, uh, and maybe it's a little more cheerful sounding, you know, and, you know, they do bring up things because so many other historians can dwell on, like, oh, we found all these, you know, Stone Age people that, you know, the archaeo, the, you know, the, the forensic evidence shows that they were beaten to a pulp or stabbed to death, and, uh, you know, Dawn of Everything says, hey, what about, like, these uh, interesting people that were buried, That you know, these dwarves or tall guys that were buried with all these, like, treasures around them what you know it's a whole plethora you know they talk about a carnival like esque experience of how social structures are made uh so there you have it there's a there's a lot going on and it's worth worth considering we shouldn't uh run into some of these common assumptions that certain uh authors give about say when you get group sizes that get very big that automatically it establishes hierarchies now uh, perhaps to some degree, but perhaps to some degree not. So I think he's, he's just saying it's not that simple. It's not that simple to say that you just get a, a hierarchy automatically from uh, having large groups of people or how you organize it. Does that mean you need to have some central leader like a president or king or emperor or something like that in a chain of command with a pyramid? Uh, or is there there's something more nuanced and um, you know in di different aspects of that? So you know they talk about um, you know Catalahoic, which is an ancient ancient site in um, uh, Tur modern day Turkey, and they didn't you know there's no evidence for them having a hierarchy, but that was a very large community. Uh, the mega sites in Eastern Europe they didn't have a uh, they didn't seem to have some central authority or police force, you know, no monopoly of force or Tihuacan in modern day Mexico didn't seem to have that either. 
Uh, so they're showing that, you know, just because it, it's a big group, you don't necessarily need to have that. Now, they give a couple examples, and I think it would be worth exploring and understanding. If you have a society or, or a group of people that are that large, how do they organize themselves to some degree? You know, if you have this big mega site in Eastern Europe and, you know, there's thousands of people living there, and there's no central authority. How do they, you know, how do you ensure that everyone's sort of respecting one another so they don't, you know, things don't escalate into violence or, you know, uh, a downward spy or spiral towards everyone uh, stealing from one another rather than, you know, cooperating from one another, with one another. And they talk about different things. It's like the corvée system where there's an annual work project that people all work together uh, in different societies. They talk about that in Mesopotamia. Um, or they talk about the Basques who uh, will pass a piece of bread along to their neighbors until uh, one passes it. Uh, one, you know, a loaf of bread reaches you back again from your family. And uh, it's these other sort of bonding associations. Now, one of the books they discount is uh, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. And they talk about these uh, four basic tiers of uh, social structure, you know, hunter-gatherers, which are band size, and then tribal groups, uh, which are cultivators, chieftain size, which are agricultural. And then, it, you know, you get into the state idea where you have, you know, tiers and hierarchies, you know, one chief with, uh, you know, a paramount chief with lower chiefs yada, 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 and, you know, they're challenging those things because they say it's not that. But one thing they do talk about in the tribe, before they get to uh, the chieftain, who tends to have secret information and a monopoly of force and all that kind of stuff, is uh, the tribes, you know, there's three basic things, like a gift economy, marriage alliances, and basically peer pressure. Those were the three things that they, they attribute to creating social order uh, without a hierarchy. Uh, again, there, you know, it's not a con it's there's no sort of conclusions with any of this. It's just basically where uh, where it goes. So anyway, we tend to think of history uh, is you know a long series of kings and you know heads of state and uh, you know what Caesar and Napoleon or whatever these central great great men were doing and uh you know rather than thinking of a broader society and uh you know also with with those things you know that we we tend to focus on uh these kingdoms or states or ancient empires and what they were up to and uh it gets back to that idea of the monopoly of violence or having somebody that commands an army that leads it and, you know, if you go back, you can think of ancient Egypt or ancient Mesopotamia, um, back to the Bronze Age and someone uh, emerging with, with that kind of power. Now, why did they, why did they emerge at that time? Because what, uh, Wingrow, and Dave, Wingrow and Graber are saying is that, uh, you know, those things that you could, there were these big societies that didn't have that. And then suddenly that started to emerge in like China, India. Uh, Middle East and, you know, the Nile. So, uh, it, you know, they don't quite get into that. And, you know, one of the things they talk about is this idea of that if you do have communities, say, that didn't have a hierarchy, but they have this common st storage facility of food uh, that can be redistributed, like grain or something like that, unlike tubers, which will rot. Maybe you can't really store them the same way. But if you have this common storage facility, then you can uh, have this sort of tax system, but it just takes someone with, uh, you know, enough the greatest capacity of violence, let's say, to go control that that storage unit, and uh, you know, then they can call the shots of how they redistribute resources and collect resources, and uh, there you have it. So then you have the emergence. Now, why did it happen specifically at that time? Maybe who knows? Maybe it was the development of body armor during the Bronze Age, uh, which I've read a book that suggests that that was the emergence of uh, authoritarian societies is when you had uh, the development of body armor. Who knows? But it did seem to sort of spread like a, like a disease across Eurasia throughout the, the chain of the Silk Roads or whatever. 
And uh, another important question is this idea of slavery, which I do really appreciate David Graeber is pushing to the first 5,000 years of really approaching and talking about uh, slavery a lot, which so many uh, books ignore just because they say there isn't enough evidence to even suggest or talk about uh, the role of slavery in developing these different societies and their social orders, their social structures, because if you have slaves, that suggests a hierarchy. If, am I wrong in that? You know, to say that one person controls another person, that means, you know, that's a hierarchy. Um, so now one thing though, that is that these, uh, is that some of these societies that don't have a central authority still have slaves. So, you know, they talk about, uh, the Tlaxcala and who are from, uh, where Mexico, modern day Mexico, like around Veracruz. And, uh, they had a council system, they had a democracy, but they also had slaves. I mean, it's the same as ancient Athens. They had a ton of slaves too. And they had a democracy. They didn't have a, a central tyrant or, uh, you know, king running everything. You know, and they also, um, they talk a lot about uh, Kondirak and the Wendat people. And uh, Kondirak's sort of intellectual understanding of liberty and freedom as being a member of the Wendat uh, uh, society. But from what I understand is that uh, the French allies, including the Wendat and others, sold their enemies after a war to the French who deported them as slaves to, say, the Caribbean or uh, another French colony. So there is this role of of uh, slavery uh, being involved even in societies that are sort of put uh, up on a pedestal in the dawn of an awful lot. So there you have it. So there is some, there's, there's a lot more complexity and I, I know they're sort of trying to emphasize the possibility of what can be. And that is, uh, it's interesting because, you know, there, there is this sort of idea of, um, these two concepts of materialism and idealism, like materialism means that, uh, our society is shaped by the environmental culture around us. Whereas, uh, idealism has more to do with our inherent, you know, what we were taught and raised through like a, uh, through our own sort of, uh, in generation to generation, our own culture is specifically something, uh, and there's a little bit of truth in both of them, right? So you think of, um, say you're talking about fashion, how fashion changes, uh, within a society. And you could talk about the material aspects, like uh, the there's less resources of certain types of fabric, uh, where they become more available with increased trade, so that it changes the way that people uh, people are making clothing. Versus, uh, you know, this group is inherently likes drab colors, and this group inherently likes bright colors. Now, maybe there's a bit of truth to both of those things. Uh, maybe another example is. Um, uh, you know, a family friend from Latin America, you know, they, he, he talked about how, where he was from, they would have a big community event, uh, on Christmas where everyone would get together where, you know, living in the United States, we all just have Christmas with our families typically, unless you're lonely and don't have a family, you know, it's a terrible day for you. But anyway, uh, you know, is that. Do they have, is it because of the weather? Is it because it's colder so everyone stays inside in the north? And then in the south, it'd be, it's hot, so you, you go outside and spend time with your family? Or is it just, is it specifically like an inherited Latin uh, trait to be more social and do stuff as, as a big bigger group community uh, on Christmas versus, you know, we're too isolated and individualistic uh, in, nor in North America or something. I don't know. I mean, you, you, someone could go into all these questions of what makes a cer certain society act the way it does versus not. So, I don't know, but uh, the dawn of everything tends to emphasize a little bit more of the idealism. They tend to shy away from the materialism. And maybe that's not such a bad thing in some ways, because, you know, why not say, hey, you know, you have the potential, if you think about it, to shape your own society, shape the, your own world around you. 
and think about how you can live in a more uh, just and fair and less hierarchical, uh, you know, society. And, but of course, you also have to understand the material limitations. Maybe there, there's very serious limitations uh, to why there are, you know, that prevent us from uh, living in a more, a better society. You know, if you live in a, a community with a lot of poverty and there's a lot of crime, maybe the lack of resources creates more crime and that creates more problems. Uh, that's a material aspect. And so just to say, hey, we're going to just have less crime because we can choose to do that. Uh, you know, is that a real, is that a real approach? So you need a bit of both. Now I'm going to end, I know it's getting a little long, but I'll just end with the last concept I thought was pretty interesting. They talk about this schismogenesis and this, this is the idea of a culture shapes itself in comparison to looking at other cultures. So, um, they use an example, the Inuits, they didn't use snowshoes because other cultures use them. The Inuits didn't use snowshoes. Even if they might've been helpful where they lived, they didn't use them because that's not what they do. They're not, Inuits don't use snowshoes and, or, um, they, Athenians and Spartans, and they contrast themselves, you know, uh, Athenians become more and more cosmopolitan and, uh, you know, a particular way versus uh, the Spartans become another way. And they constantly compare one, uh, one another to themselves that they try to di differentiate one another from themselves. And that's sort of this idea of how, uh, you know, cultures shape themselves and think of themselves, of course, in contrast to another culture. You can't understand a, a culture without being aware that you're putting your own lens or your own self from that and contrast yourself from that. How can you say you're from a violent society uh, unless you can find other more peaceful societies that will uh, you can contrast that from? Um, and I guess it's kind of going back to this idea of how states develop and how we think of uh, how states develop. Uh, come to be as they are because you know going back to this whole idea the, the monopoly of violence which you know is just one part of uh what you can think of as the state you know the bureaucracy the secret information uh the control of violence or the charismatic uh the, the charismatic leaders um is that you know how did how does that come to be realized because it wasn't quite there in say ancient egypt or ancient mesopotamia or ancient china but it is, you know, kind of in the modern age of how we think the certain certain uh, rules of when we think of, you know, different countries and, you know, what the UN will recognize as a state. So I guess this modern conception, I don't have the answer to this, but I thought this was interesting. It was just a couple sentences in a really long book about the 30 years war by Peter Wilson. But he talks about, uh, you know, this is the early modern period, the 1600s. There's a lot of different European kingdoms there, and but he talks about uh, different monarchs like James I of England or Henri IV of France and how they sort of play this uh, indispensable role as a diplomatic mediator between two different, uh, two other kingdoms. So you have, say, King James, and there's a war between Denmark and Sweden. He goes in and acts as the diplomatic mediator. And, um, you know, that action as a mediator, you know, creates more of this awareness of what the different entities are and seeing all three, uh, you know, as, as what they all are the same, you know, how they all operate as, as a state and more of that realization. Now that's more of kind of a diplomatic angle of looking at that, but it's, it's just a little thought. It's just a little thought I had, <laughs> I throw in there. Maybe it doesn't mean much. But in terms of like how we come to realizations and the, the triangulation of, of three rather than the schismogenesis of two. So anyway, um, I, if you like, if you like ancient history or just learning about society and, uh, you know, social history, I would encourage anyone to read The Dawn of Everything, even if it's not everything. It's still an awful lot. All right.